sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern. Tonight, a federal judge struck down the mandatory mask requirement on commercial airlines. And you could hear the singing from 30,000 feet. Netflix lost 200,000 subscribers last quarter. The singing you're hearing from them is the blues. And CNN Plus is a bust after only two weeks. We've got that and more tonight on this Friday, April the 22nd, 2022. Hi, I'm Andre Laborde, and welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up for this Friday, April the 22nd, 2022. I hope your week went well. Well, coming up tonight, we've got a great special guest that you will not want to miss. Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison has been on the national stage for quite some time. Her last position was as U.S. Ambassador to NATO during the last administration. Prior to that, she was a U.S. Senator representing the state of Texas for 20 years. We'll be talking with Ukraine, about Ukraine, Russia's invasion and the prospects for victory, plus oil and gas production in the United States. We'll have that and more with Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison coming up. But first, how did the markets do this week? Well, all the indexes, it was bloody. All the indexes closed lower for the week. It was a, it was a bloody day on Wall Street. The Dow Jones at one point was down over 1,000 points at, for the day, and it still ended down for about 970 points as the close of this day. Well, this week, the Dow Jones ended at 33,813, and that was down 1.8% for the day. And the S&P 500, they closed at 4,271. It was down two and three quarter percent for the week. And the NASDAQ, they ended at 12,839. It was down 3.8 percent for the week. Well, let's get to our guest this evening. Kay Bailey Hutchison last served as U.S. Ambassador to NATO. Prior to that, she was a sitting U.S. Senator from Texas. And best of all, She's here with us tonight. Hi, Senator. Welcome to Wall Street Wrap-Up. Well, thank you, Andre. It's great to be with you. Well, we're happy to have you, Senator. Senator, about, about a week ago, um, on 60 Minutes, the uh, Vladimir Zelensky, who the president of Ukraine, was being interviewed. One thing, he was talking about NATO, and he said that they're, they're not giving him what what he's needing to fight the Russians. And also, he talked about the Security Council, that if they're not able to help, then really, what, what use are they? Do you think NATO is helping Vladimir Zelensky out as much as, as they possibly could? I do think they are doing so much. I know, uh, for instance, Slovakia is uh, looking now at ways to get the S-400 in there. Uh, some of them have gone, and even the MiG, Slovakia is stepping up. Poland is certainly stepping up. I think all of our allies are giving in different ways, and certainly we know America is doing a lot. Uh, we want America to do more. Uh, we really we are so supportive, and we do understand the frustration. I, I cannot imagine what President Zelensky is going through and seeing his own people be brutally murdered, massacred, uh, tortured even. Um, so, you know, he has a right to say, you've got to do more. And we understand that. We also are looking at other ways that we can be helpful, and I, I think we I think we are doing a lot, but we could do more, particularly in the area, uh, Andre, of uh, stopping the uh, the revenue stream that Russia has from its oil and gas. We cannot allow them to continue to require rubles, for instance, uh, and sell their oil and gas to pay to massacre Ukrainians. Senator, that's a very good point, because I'm curious. I mean, we have countries that are part of the EU, and I'm thinking of Germany or Hungary, um, and India is not part of the EU, but I, I know that they also get Russian gas. What can we as the United States do to um, pressure these countries to, to not buy oil, Russian oil? 
there are a lot of things we can do because we have trade relationships with countries that are continuing to help Vladimir Putin. Certainly China is. And we, we're using diplomatic skills, but maybe not uh, clamping down where we could on actual trade uh, relations. And I, I'm puzzled by India. I really am. I think the president was right to call India, Modi, and to say, what are you doing uh, propping up this monster? And I, I, I think the Indian people w would not approve of um, of giving a revenue stream to Russia if you are if they are seeing what we are seeing in the hor horrific uh, murders of the Ukrainian people and not to mention decimating their cities uh, I mean it's just rubble over there in some of these cities that the Russians have just uh, bombed and uh, and indiscriminately targeted civilians. The city of Maripol, uh, they were talking about, about Vladimir Putin possibly even using chemical weapons. Where's our red line? That is a red line for me, uh, mm -hmm. that they would be using chemical weapons. For one thing, that is outside all the parameters of what Russia has agreed to in the past. I think that we should be drawing a red line on the use of chemical weapons. All of our NATO allies have said that is a game changer. Russia is going over the line already in the uh, treacherous uh, treatment of civilians. And so I think that um, I think we're certainly hopefully looking at all of that and ready to deter and uh, fight back uh, on any kind of chemical use. Vladimir Putin had put in as his lead general, um, you were talking about Syria. Uh, I think he's he's known as like the butcher of Syria uh, because of his, <laughs> his his tactics. The personality of Vladimir Putin is that his, is his back against the wall so that he's trying to save face, that he knows that it's not going the, the way he had planned, that he's now going full force? All of the military people are believing that his back is against a wall and he reacts uh, to be more aggressive when that happens. And they have studied uh, his actions uh, in that way. So I, I think he has become, uh, the leadership has become more and more horrific uh, as they have lost more and more ground. And I, I think the way the uh, military uh, people are talking about it, is that what this has exposed is a very untrained Russian military, and it, it's been a surprise. The um, lack of professionalism in the soldiers has been somewhat of a surprise. True. Yeah, one of one of your fellow senators that you when you when you served in the Senate, John McCain, used to call Russia a uh, it was a gas station with nuclear weapons. You're right, Andre. Uh, John McCain called Vladimir Putin a, a thug uh, mm -hmm. back when he was in the Senate. He knew Putin. He had, uh, had been around him for years, of course, all the time he was serving in the Senate, but John came from military. But also, uh, John McCain knew that uh, you could never trust his word. And when he, like when he said that he would uh, allow a, a corridor for people to leave the country, and then he bombed the corridor. Uh, I mean, that's just so Putin. And John McCain was very clear-eyed about uh, Putin and the need to deter against Putin and not trust him. And I think that his words are coming back in many respects. But here we are. Uh, with tanks that don't run and lined up, unable to uh, do anything, and making mistakes that wouldn't have been made in World War I. Vladimir Putin's word really can't be trusted. So I know that they want a truce right now, which I think is also a code word for wanting his army to, uh, to regroup, to be able to get stronger. But he wants, to, I'm sure he wants to keep the territories that he so far has, has gotten. And I'm assuming, 
Vladimir Zelensky is wanting the Russians to pull out of Ukraine altogether, which I'm sure Putin will not want to do. But even no matter what, can you even really trust Putin at whatever he says? You know, I dealt at NATO with uh, Russia and the INF Treaty, and we kept saying to our allies, Russia is violating the INF Treaty. They are building the weapons that they agreed not to build, which is an intermediate-range ballistic missile, and they and it is a missile that could have a nuclear warhead on it. And he was doing this for years, and we kept pointing it out, and the Russians, with a straight face, would say, oh, well, we're not doing that, and we would show pictures they are not telling the truth. And it's sort of like the so old saying, you're going to believe me or you're lying eyes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's just, it's pathetic in so many ways. But when when you're thinking of, of a negotiation with this man, uh, and then you think about the fact that he called President Zelensky a Nazi, <laughs> which is absurd. And I think that President Zil what appears to be happening right now is that uh, President Putin is going where he has been the most active for years, and that is the eastern Donbass region and Crimea, because it gives him a strategic hold on the Black Sea, and it gives them a, a sea outlet that they very much want. That would be Odessa, uh, as well as Mariupol and uh, the Crimea area. And then to solidify the eastern uh, front that would allow them that capability to have uh, the strip of land that connects to the Black Sea and I think it looks like right now that that he is regrouping there because that's what he has wanted and he's wanted for years. I think uh, Zelensky has been magnificent in his response to this and his bravery, even though he, all of the intel showed that he was a target for assassination. But he said, I am staying, I am with my people, and we're fighting for our country. And you have to admire him so much for the way he has handled all of this pressure and has reached out for help throughout the world, and he's gotten so much help. Prior to 1994, Ukraine had the third largest amount of nuclear weapons in, in their area, uh, Russia being United States, Russia, and Ukraine, because when the Soviet Union pulled back, well, there was a, an agreement called the, the Budapest Memorandum, and the Soviet Union, Russia, promised not to invade, and the way I understand and read the, the memorandum was that the United States promised to protect Ukraine in the event that if you give up your nuclear weapons, we then will do this, which would be of a protection. And it was signed in 1994 when Bill Clinton was the president. Do you think the United States, does, do we have an obligation to protect them? Well, I do think that, that I think President Zelensky is right to be concerned about uh, giving up the weapons and trusting uh, Putin uh, not to invade and then to expect us to be helpful. And I think we are being helpful. I think we're being helpful in many ways. I think we could do more, and I think we are obligated to do more. I think the sanctions have to go much further. I think we should be uh, making sure that they get the uh, particularly at this point, the two things that they have said they want that have not yet occurred are the Russian airplanes that they know how to use and the would give them out. more power in the air, mm -hmm. and then the Navy, the, the naval uh, weapons that would help them to protect Odessa and these uh, border countries on the Black Sea, uh, because the Russian Navy is is using those attack ships uh, to go into Ukraine. So we need to be able to help Ukraine have the capability to take out those ships that are obliterating their uh, their border coastal cities.
the, the administration was going back and forth prior, um, even Vice President Kamala Harris and um, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan were all, and, and others, were all saying how uh, the sanctions were to deter. And then the president, a couple of weeks back, said, well, the sanctions were never meant to deter. Uh, so they, they, they have their messages not on the, on the same wavelength. Do you think that the sanctions are having a, a, a positive effect against Russia? I think the sanctions are are marginally helping. Yes, I think that it is hurting the economy of uh, Russia, but they're not complete, and they need to be complete. They need to. We need to be able to shut down all of the banks. But Russia has cleverly said that they are going to uh, require all payments be made in rubles to prop up their economy and and their uh, revenue stream and some of the some of the countries that are now taking Russian oil are paying in rubles and I think that is a mistake I think we need to bear down and not allow him to have any kind of a revenue stream that will keep him afloat and I don't think we're there yet. I think there are more banks that need need to be uh, shut down so that you they're not going to be able to use their rubles in the international marketplace. And I think also we have to cut off the dependency on oil and natural gas that is so important. And I think that is going to make the difference. And, and I think we could do more to show that we are going to have energy excess that we can export to our uh, European neighbors. Our oil and gas industry is not going to ramp up production when, they, when there are regulations that are stopping them from having LNG facilities built. There are regulations against the pipelines that would be able to carry the oil and gas. We need to have a reset on our own capabilities to create the clean energy that we create, because we, when we create natural gas, it's the best, cleanest form of energy that, that is pr produced anywhere else in the world, and export to our neighbors to get them off the Russian uh, dependency. And True. Andre, they, yes, it will take some time to build these LNG facilities, but Putin will see the handwriting on the wall if we open up and say, we have a goal of being energy independent and creating excess for our European allies. That would be very recognized by Putin to know that his days would be numbered in holding this hammer over the European allies for his oil and gas. We're going to take a break right now. We're talking, if you're just joining us, with former senator from Texas, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who was also the former ambassador to NATO. We'll take a break, but don't go away because we'll be right back. happy to have former Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson as our guest. Uh, Senator Hutchinson was also the former ambassador to NATO. Senator, right before going into a break, we were talking about oil and gas and how, you know, so many of the European Union countries are so dependent on Russia with the oil and gas. You you live in a state that is uh, their number one in oil and gas, and Louisiana and other states are as well, too. Uh, do you think this may, may finally force possibly the administration and others to to reduce the regulatory um, roadblocks? Andre, you are right on the main point, and that is our drillers, our producers would go in and, and make the natural gas, the oil refining, uh, if they knew that there was a regulatory um, support for stability 
to know that the investments that they have to make up front, they're huge, costly um, investments that have to be made to build an LNG facility or to refine oil or to put it in a pipeline or to even build a pipeline. I think if there was a signal from the administration that there would be a change in the regulatory delays and the regulatory schemes that really combine to make it hard to depend on a long term that they could have a rational uh, financial decision to go forward and build a pipeline or build an LNG facility. And pipelines ha have shown that they are much more environmentally friendly than putting oil and gas just on trucks or trains or uh, uh, really taking much more of a carbon imprint. So I, I think I also France is been... also talking about an LNG facility now. Uh, that they are... Yes, they are. France yeah. and Germany uh, mm -hmm. has gone back into that. And, of course, no one talks about nuclear anymore, but n nuclear is a very clean energy, uh, and it's very expensive to build, but then it is much less expensive to operate, and it becomes a lower cost for consumers uh, that do have the nuclear energy. But many of the even the states in America, like California and New York, are beginning to ban nuclear, which is a clean form of energy that is also cost effective if you have the regulatory environment that our producers can see that the investment will be able to be paid back and become a, a profitable uh, enterprise. And if we do that, then we will have access that we can help our European allies, and it will be a win for everyone all the way around, because then Europe will never have to be under the thumb of Vladimir Putin again. About three weeks ago, there was a, an oil and gas conference in Houston, Texas, and uh, Daniel Jurgen, who wrote the book The Prize, uh, was talking about it, and he said they had more representatives from the EU uh, uh, questioning about how to build their own LNG terminals in Europe, that I think this was a wake-up call all the way around. What we were discussing earlier about Russia, and I'm thinking going on the other side of the globe of China, you know, Xi Jinping is looking at this, of what's going on, how the, how the UN is handling it, how NATO is handling this. Do you think, and I know Xi Jinping certainly wants Taiwan as part of, as part of their Chinese domain, do you think what's happening will will stop Xi Jinping from possibly going into Taiwan, or do you think that he may not have a better chance than right now of going in to Taiwan? Very interesting question, Andre, because uh, Xi Jinping uh, is, I think, wanting to test uh, the whole situation with Taiwan, but I think he's been sideswiped by Vladimir Putin because Putin has done this horrendous invasion of Ukraine and has failed in many respects and is now a pariah uh, on the international, um, in the international world. And I think she is looking at this and saying, well, we now I'm being paired with him, Putin, and I'm not very comfortable with that. Um, so I don't, I don't know where he will come out. Uh, I think Putin decided to test America to see if we were soft and not going to be very tough. I think he was testing NATO. I think uh, we have come through with NATO being even more united than ever and probably expanding. You know, Sweden and Finland are both talking about joining NATO. Finland especially has a very long border with uh, Russia. But I think she um, is looking at this and saying, is, is, do I want to be a pariah with all of the trade um, entanglements that she has and depends on for the economy of China. Um, does he really want to do that? Maybe. I, I can't predict, but I certainly think he has been put in an awkward position by Putin, and I don't think he wants to be paired with Putin. And I, I hope that both she and Modi in India will uh, say that they want to be part of a uh, 
a trading partnership that is free and fair. That's why we allowed China into the World Trade Organization. And I hope that's the path that the president, she takes, but I can't predict. Senator, well, unfortunately, we're out of time this time, but I hope you come back. Thank you, Andre. It was great talking with you. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate it. Well, if you've got a question about finance or a comment about the show, we'd love to hear from you. Make it pithy, concise, and write us at Andre at WallStreetWrapUp.info. And now we'll look ahead for next week. But first, what billionaire CEO created a video game called Blastar at the age of 10 years old? We'll have the answer in just a moment. Well, what billionaire CEO created a video game called Blastar at the age of 10? Elon Musk. He later sold the code to PC and Office Technology magazine for $500. 10 years old. Think he can help Twitter? And finally, CNN Plus is a bust. After only two weeks of selling subscriptions as a streaming pay service, CNN Plus has pulled the plug. CNN Plus hired some big names as Chris Wallace from Fox News, but the streaming service was the brainchild of former CNN president Jeff Zucker, who invested over $300 million of the company's money into the venture before he was fired last month for an intimate relationship with another CNN employee. Now, the demise comes days after the Discovery Channel took over the, the parent company, Warner Media, which owns CNN, and they supposedly saw little interest in Zucker's creation. Now, well, why the people would pay $6 a month for programming that ratings for the free portion of CNN have been plummeting, well, I'm sure is going to be discussed on business channels as this one, which, by the way, that's a perfect segue into what's coming up in a couple of weeks. My guest is going to be James Miller, author, author of the new book called Tinderbox. Now, the story of Warner Brothers, Warner Media, HBO, and yes, CNN, and the jockeying for power. Well, if you thought Game of Thrones was just an H HBO series, think again. There was just as much corporate intrigue and, and such going on behind the cameras as there was in front of it. We'll be discussing the CNN Plus bust, HBO, the Discovery Channel, the merger with Warner Media with author James Miller of Tinderbox. Also coming up on the Wall Street Wrap-Up, we're going to be discussing oil and gas production, both domestically and the importing of oil for the United States. We'll be talking with the former Secretary of Energy and CEO of Sempra Oil and Gas, Dan Brulette. Since January of last year, the new, the new administration has dramatically reduced oil and gas drilling on federal land. We all felt the pain at the pump with gas rising to over 48 percent since last year. Former Secretary of Energy Dan Brulette on Wall Street Wrap-Up. Well, and as a reminder, we repeat the show on Sunday mornings. But always the best way is to set your DVR so you'll never miss an episode. And that is our show for Friday and April the 22nd, 2022. I hope you enjoyed it. And we really thank so much Senator Kay Bailey Hutchinson for joining us this evening. But as always, it's you. We appreciate you for allowing us into your homes tonight. Remember, you can always follow us on all the social media on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and WYES.org. So have a great weekend ahead and a productive week as well. I'll see you next week for Wall Street Wrap-Up. I'm Andre Laborde. And remember, money never sleeps. Good night. Sponsored by New Orleans Distillers, creators of fine spirits and liqueurs. Through dedication to science, art, and passion, blends of tradition and flavor emerge. For you, always locally crafted. New Orleans Distillers, classically Southern.